able to watch back. There we go, that old friend. Um, yeah, so I'm going to share my screen. And um, as you would have seen in the description when you signed up, um, <clears throat> today we're going to be talking about encouraging reluctant readers for secondary schools. So um, I know, Oshin, you're a champion of reading. Katie, are you a teacher? I'm so sorry, you're going to have to remind me. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I am, yeah. Super, um, what's good? Uh, Breed, Clondalkin. Super, good to see you. Thank you so much for tuning on. I just wanted to check in case there's any parents. Um, sometimes we get some parents signing on and it just means I can kind of change things up a little bit as they needed. But um, yeah, I'm just going to go through the PowerPoint presentation. And like you've said, if you have any questions, you can drop them into the chat or ask at the end. <clears throat> um, most of you know me. So if you have any questions, my contact email is bookgifting at, ch at Children's Books Ireland. Dot AE. Um, if you do have any questions post this presentation or in general about books, you can just ask me. So, oh, there you go. Um, so what makes a reluctant reader? Um, I know we kind of talked about this in the introduction a little bit, but there are, I suppose, a lot of factors as to why uh, secondary school students in particular might find it really, really difficult to get interested into in reading. <clears throat> and this presentation is kind of just to talk about what those issues are and how we can address them. Um, a lot of the information that we're coming with this evening is actually coming from um, directly from students and their feedback. So um, as part of the many book gifting programs that we do in Children's Books Ireland, <clears throat> they get a library of book donations. They get a champion of reading, which is an author or an illustrator to come and do many workshops with them. And we also give resources like these workshops to the parents and guardians and teachers at the school. Um, but at the end of every project, we also uh, initiate surveys with the students and ask them questions about their reading habits, what they're interested in, what they're not interested in. And one of the big questions that I'm really excited to <laughs> always ask at the end of every term is why are you, uh, what would make you a reluctant reader or what makes you less likely to read or what makes you more likely to read? And the in answers that come back are fascinating to me. Um, we get kind of three main categories and you can see them here. <clears throat> the first one is always, you know, a pretty obvious answer you hear it all the time is time. They just don't have the time to read. Um, the second one that comes up quite a lot is the interest. They just don't find books that are interesting to them or they just have preference over other things. And the last one is the one that's the most interesting to me. And we'll talk about it in more detail later, but <clears throat> it's the lack of community or lack of sense of community when it comes to reading. So what we're going to do is over the next hour, we're going to kind of take time to assess what these issues are. Sorry, my internet is not the best. So if I do cut out, you're just going to have to let me know if you can't hear me at any stage. Is that OK? Can you see that OK? A thumbs up. Yeah, that's good. Right. We can see it We're back at the beginning. Perfect. Um, this may happen. I just have really bad internet. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so what we're going to do is talk about the first one, which is time. <clears throat> so um. Something that comes up time and time again is that we say, oh, like, what is the reason that a teenager um, just isn't able to get down to, you know, pick up a book and to read? They always say, we just don't have time. And I get it. It's, you know, an incredibly busy period of their life. They come from primary school where everything is scheduled down to a T and they come into secondary school and all of a sudden they're in charge of managing their own time a lot more. And their schedules become incredibly busy. You're doing schoolwork. You're doing so much more study in secondary school. <clears throat> you're also engaging in a lot more activities outside of school. You're getting ready for the future when you're in the senior cycle. It's a very time consuming period of your life. So we really do kind of emphasize with the uh, lack of time commitment that they can give to reading. Um, I have a couple of points here uh, as to like little moments here and there that we can take in the day to encourage them to read <clears throat> um, things like commuting to school, break times when they have a task completed um, in class, um, breakfast book clubs, waiting for the bus and lifts home, uh, waiting for the class to start and before after school study. So it's all well and good for me to say, OK, these are like little pockets of time that they can take to read in the school day. <clears throat> and you might look at it and kind of say, oh, look, 
this isn't really enough time at all. Like you'll barely get two or three pages done. But realistically, that's kind of all they need is just to get two or three pages, five, 10 pages a day kind of thing. Um, and it makes such a difference. Like if they read five to 10 pages a day, they'd have a book read a month, which is, <laughs> I think, really impressive. I think if they got a book month, a book a month done, that's that's a huge win for me. And uh, just kind of stealing those little moments um, throughout the day is really important. But like I said, it's all well and good for us to kind of say, you know, this is the time where you can just pick up a book for five minutes and have a few pages read, that kind of thing. But it's they're not likely to do it unless we help facilitate them to do that. So I think that's where it's really important for uh, schools to kind of jump in and facilitate a space and an opportunity for these things to happen. <laughs> So, for example, if your school doesn't have um, like a designated library space in your school, that's totally fine. A lot of schools don't and it's hard to carve it out when you can. But if you even got like a, a nook or a reading corner with a couple of bean bags or some comfy chairs or even just a nice couple of pillows, that kind of thing. And just putting it somewhere a little bit quieter, somewhere tucked away, <clears throat> that means that that space is designated for students to go and read during their break times or before class starts or um be before the school day starts or in between study sessions it's just kind of carving out that physical space to make sure that that is there if you don't actually have a physical library and um, other things like you could kind of revamp and redesign places that already exist so for example if there's like um a bench outside where it's like um you know they're waiting for the buses they're waiting for the cars and there's um some seating available while they're waiting outside make that into like a little outdoor reading nook or something like that and just kind of redesign it and make it more uh I suppose a little bit more in their face <laughs> that this is somewhere you can go and read um and take the time out to do that. And um, so it's it's very much a kind of give and take. We um I suppose as uh facilitators and as uh gatekeepers for lack of a better word to reading for students, it's really important that we make sure that space is there for them. Um, because they'll find the excuse to not have the time. Um, so we just need, need to make sure that they don't have the excuse that they don't have the space, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, second thing that I think is really interesting uh, in terms of the feedback that we got from students is a uh, reason they don't read is because they don't feel very confident reading. And I totally get it. Like it's, <laughs> it's really hard to, um, I suppose, engage in an activity that you feel like you're bad at doing it. Like nobody wants to do something that they know they're bad at or they think they're bad at. <clears throat> and when you try it and you really struggle and you feel like it's getting harder and harder, the more you try and you're not meeting like a uh, material that's connecting with you, you're less and less likely to enjoy it and you're less likely to uh, feel good about reading it. And I think it's really interesting that, um, you know, over the last couple of years, particularly during COVID, there has been a real knock in confidence in textual literacy over the last couple of years. And we need to find ways in which to make sure that that textual literacy is supported through other mediums or through other formats or through other practices of reading. And um, something that came up over and over again, I was really surprised by this, but I thought it was so interesting. Um, a student said during the feedback sessions, it's harder now. Um, I don't read anymore because it's harder now and I have to read more by myself instead of the teacher reading to me. And I was just like, oh, my God, of course, because <laughs> like. Think about it when you're in sixth class and you're in primary school your teacher's reading to you every week and you all read a story together and that's really lovely <clears throat> and then all of a sudden you you hit 13 you go into secondary school and nobody's reading to you anymore <laughs> i just think it's so um i just i think it's really interesting that that was something that several students had said they're not getting read to anymore and they feel like it's a loss in their in their reading habits because of it so what i've done is i've kind of picked out a few different um, opportunities in which students can have stuff read to them. Um, for example, at assembly meetings, have a short story read at the end of the session or at the start of the session. Uh, something that's kind of compact and concise, so it's not something you have to return to and pick up on next week again, um, but something that's like quite a short form. <clears throat> something that's been really lovely, I've seen a, school, a few schools do, is doing poetry over the intercom and um, kind of reading out a poem once a day or once a week, um, which is always really lovely. And the classic uh, reading novel extracts at the end of a week. And I know it's really hard to do this when you're teaching English and you have so much of the curriculum to get through and you don't have time to kind of engage in non 
uh, curriculum work I totally get it it is very hard to carve that time out <clears throat> but again it kind of comes back to that thing of like five minutes and um, taking five minutes at the end of the week and reading a couple of pages to your students and by the end of your term you'd have a whole book read that kind of thing <clears throat> and they can help pick out what book they'd want um, as well so there's a lot of I suppose involvement in the type of stories that you're telling also, in terms of confidence, um, it's really important that we give accessible reads to students. Uh, like I said earlier, there is a real need for, um, I suppose, there's more, less of a demand of um, very text heavy books in recent years. Students tend to be leaning a lot towards um, illustrated books, which is great because we want to encourage them to have visual literacy as well. And <clears throat> what we want to do is to make sure that we're kind of, I suppose, deconstructing the notion that picture books are for very small children because they're not and um, anyone who has read a graphic novel that you know it, it they're they're excellent forms of storytelling graphic novels illustrated books um comic books that kind of thing just kind of normalizing having illustrations in books for older readers is really important and um, the second <laughs> type of accessible read that i think is really important is first novels anyone who knows me knows that i will never shut up about verse novels. I am constantly talking about them. Um, they, to explain what a verse novel is, is that it's it's a book that has a beginning, middle and end. It has a story, it has an arc, it has characters. It's a regular book in every means, except that instead of it being written in prose with big long paragraphs, a lot of text, it's written in a series of poems. So it's written in verse. And it just means that the pages are really, really short and um, there's very little text on the page and you fly through it like you really really skip through it and um, something I always say to young readers is full disclosure I was not a great reader when I was a teenager <laughs> at all and I didn't read very much in college and what got me back into reading re like in the last couple of years was verse novels and um, you know reading a verse novel made me feel like oh I actually feel like I can read a 400 page book in one sitting and did do that on a regular basis and that kind of thing just kind of gives you that boost of saying, oh, I can actually finish a book and I feel better having finished that book. Um, and of course, short books are really important as well. We're seeing a trend in publishing recently where books are getting shorter and shorter, and um, which I think is calling to the demand for those kind of stories, which is great. Um, Barrington Stoke are obviously the kind of go-to people for short books and um, do provide a lot of really excellent quality material. They are a publisher that specialise in making dyslexia friendly titles <clears throat> because the pages that they use is like slightly kind of yellowish paper and the font that they use is specially designed to avoid um the kind of letters flipping around and um, jumping around that dyslexic readers have trouble with and um that's their kind of specialty they make a lot of very short books they're really easy to flick through and they're all made by well-established authors and illustrators um, so like you'll have your Mallory Blackman, you'll have uh, Tanya Landman, you'll have own call for <laughs> making books for readers who, um, you know, they're kind of like the big names. So it's not a case of like these are lesser quality books. They're really high quality books made by the best for the best, that kind of thing. So they're really excellent. Um, there we go. The most interesting thing, I think, <laughs> with the survey feedback that we got is um a sense of community when it comes to reading so i think a lot of people know that when you are dealing with uh kind of especially first years in particular they're coming in from first from sixth class and they're kind of in this new school environment and their priority when they first come in is not to <laughs> their priority is to find a community a group of friends that they can stick with because those first especially those first couple of months are so crucial for them to find their group and to establish relationships with other people. And the way that they do that is by doing community-based activities. So when it comes up to a kind of a toss-up between going and joining a team and doing sports with a group or hanging out with your friends or joining a band, they're all very community-based activities that are both like kind of um feeding their interests but also fulfilling that need for a sense of community that they can have in secondary school versus what they may see as a very solitary activity in reading so I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to tell you that reading isn't a solitary activity because it is 
Um, but I do think that there are ways where it's really important to reframe it as not just a solitary activity. And there are ways where it can be a lot more communal. And in doing so, that means that it will just be a little bit more accessible for young people to come in and connect with their friends and connect with other students through books in the way that they would through music or through sports or anything else. So there's a couple of pretty obvious ones here book clubs and um, creative writing groups <clears throat> um, they're kind of self-explanatory they're gatherings to get together I will say with book clubs and um, they don't have to be book clubs where you all read the same book at the same time it's really nice for them to just have a get together and talk about whatever it is they're reading at the time so there's no pressure to um, I suppose <laughs> read a genre of a book that they're just not interested in because that's the quickest way to um, I suppose Dis disengage with reading as a habit um, and <clears throat> creative writing groups are always really fun because it's all to do with storytelling it's all to do with books and stories um, and there's also like a real sense of collaboration with those when you share um, your writing with somebody else and somebody else can give you tips and recommendations based on books that they think they may like that kind of thing is very collaborative and um, setting up a blog on your school website for book reviews and this, again, is a really kind of collaborative process where somebody could read and write the review and um, another person could edit it. Another person can put it onto the website and they can all share their reviews and share their ideas and styles as to how they uh, approach the different stories. Um, and I know that kind of revol involves a little bit more administrative assistance from the school staff, <clears throat> but I think it's really worth the while and kids really do enjoy kind of seeing that hey, I wrote something and it's on the school website for literally everyone to see. And it's also a nice way for parents and guardians to uh, see that kind of, um, I suppose, engagement with reading happen from home and maybe encourage them to read a little bit more at home as well. Something else that um, I think most schools that are a part of this program will have already done, we'll say it anyway, is set up a reading committee. <clears throat> reading committees are really important because they kind of act like a representative for the reading culture in the school. And um, they can be students who go around surveying other students to see what the relationship with reading is, what people would like to do in terms of reading, what would make um, that specific student body more likely to read <clears throat> because it's different for every school. So some schools might say, oh, uh, I'd read more if my friends are reading more. Another school might say I'd read more if we had a space to read in, blah, blah, blah. So having a reading committee and having them establish themselves as the voice and the advocates for any reading related activities is a really nice way for them to bond together. <clears throat> I will say that it's quite important for the reading committee to uh, not just be filled with bookworms. Um, it can be, but it is also, there's a lot of value and benefit to have students who aren't necessarily big readers be a part of the reading committee because they offer insights, really valuable insights as to why reading doesn't work for them and how that can be uh, addressed for each school. Um, other things in kind of tangent to the book reviews is doing a bookish podcast. Um, I don't think there isn't, <laughs> there's there's very few teenagers who haven't thought about making a podcast in their lives at some point also goes for most adults, but um, I think it could be really cool to get um, students involved in making a podcast and um, I suppose just talking about the books that they're reading in a very casual format and sharing that with their students and they can also share clips of it online or on the intercom um, in the same way that you would read out the poetry and stuff like that. <clears throat> So this has potential to reach a wider audience outside of that group. Um, another thing I think it's <laughs> is I will recognize saying that this is a very big ask, but I think it's really important, is to organize visits to book events. So festivals, launches, and workshops. Um, there are there's such a rich culture of of um reading and book festivals in Ireland. Uh, between September and December, we have Redline, Dublin Book Festival, and much more that I can't even think of right now. And uh, we have International Literature Festival in Dublin in May, I think. Um, and like every every year, we're kind of seeing more and more of a growth of events for young people. So a lot of them are for children, but there are, there has been more events specifically for teenagers in recent years, which is great to see. And the way that we can kind of help increase that engagement is by 
having more students go to these events with the schools. Um, also, what would be really lovely is bringing them to a book launch. <clears throat> so say, for example, you're reading a book by Adiba Jagerbar and you want to, uh, in, you know, you love the book and you want to bring her, bring them to the launch of her next book, bring them into Dublin, into city centre and have them go to the launch as a group. It could be a really lovely activity and you could, <clears throat> um, I suppose, really show them the extent of the book community in Ireland that extends beyond just the school. Um, and also workshop. There, there's loads of workshops <clears throat> across the country um, that are both workshops that can be brought into the school, but also you can go out to see them. Uh, Fighting Words is a really excellent one. And um, Paper Lanterns is also quite a good uh, organization. They do some workshops through festivals, but also worth kind of saying to your teenagers, uh, Paper Lanterns Liter Literary Journal are a teen and YA journal that write for teenagers and are by teenagers. So by that, I mean, uh, teenagers from the age of seven of 13 to 18 can submit their work. And if their work is selected, it can be poetry, short stories, artwork, photography, um, essays, anything at all. And if they're selected, they will get published in the journal. And it's, um, thanks Milema. They'll get published in the journal and uh, they also get paid for it. If you're under the age of 15, you get paid uh, in book tokens. And if you're over the age of 15, you get paid in cold hard cash, which is always a very <laughs> inciting uh, reason, reason for them to, to go ahead and submit some work to them. But um, again, it's all to do with like encouraging that um, creative practice that leads to the publication of books. So I think it's really important to very much bring them into that kind of side of the world uh, when it comes to book, book making. And last but not least, social media which brings me very nicely on to the phone question um, because we all dread the phone question. Um, <laughs> a big reason when I ask uh, the grown-ups, I ask the teachers or the parents, what is stopping your child from reading? They always say phones. <laughs> so I'm not going to say phones aren't distracting uh, your readers. I'm not going to say that they're you know, totally fine. I do think that there's a lot of value to be had in phones when it comes to encouraging um, your your reader. So I'd say we stop fighting them and just start working with them. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's a real sense of community to be found through social media. Um, and these are kind of the main platforms that they show up on. There's BookTok, Bookstagram, BookTube and Book Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it now. Not really so much for teenagers anymore. I don't think it's as popular a platform as the other three would be, but um, it still very much exists. And <clears throat> I think it's really important to make sure that, um, you know, rather than, uh, you know, framing social media as a distraction from reading, they can very much be, uh, I suppose, an encouragement for reading. Um, full disclosure, Something I kind of tell teenagers is that, like, you know, I, I joined social media and it's made me a better reader, <laughs> which seems counterintuitive, but um, it meant that I was seeing more books that were in tune with my uh, tastes, my preferences. And it also encouraged me to read more because I wanted to talk about the books that I was reading on social media. So it's kind of like a, a backwards incentive, but I do think that there's um, a lot of value to be had in, um, I suppose, getting them to talk about books with their friends. And if that's done through social media, that's great. And um, something that you could do, and this really depends on what suits your school. So some schools have policies that don't allow for this, but if your school does allow for it, um, you could set up a social media account that's monitored by a staff member <clears throat> and make content for that, all about books through that social media account. So you could say St. Mary Secondary School, um, you know, library, Instagram account and you could curate it and um, but get the students involved in terms of writing posts in terms of being in the videos that kind of stuff it all has to do with what consent is in place with your school and just making sure that you're abiding by the guidelines with that but I do think that you know the opportunity for some kids to be a little bit more online is very much uh, an exciting concept to them and they might use that to be a little bit more engaged with reading as a whole um, and also phones are also, a, you know, where the apps are. <laughs> um, so they are not just to distract your child from reading. They can be there to encourage them to read. 
uh, ebooks and audiobooks can all be done on the phone. Um, the one that I use the most is Borrowbox, <coughs> which is the library service and um, the I Irish library services uh, go to um, app. It's actually a really well made app as well. It's very accessible. And they have a whole bunch of audiobooks, a whole bunch of ebooks, and you can read and listen to those on your phone. So I say we kind of maybe start time to think about phones not being the enemy to books, but more as an an aid in certain ways to encourage it a little bit more. So we've talked about, um, I'm just actually going to check the time. Yes. So I talked a little bit about um, what those kind of barriers are and um, the kind of points that I talked about over the last bit were really good ways to get readers who are kind of interested in reading, but, you know, they don't need as much encouragement to get involved. They're kind of for the students who already have an interest and want to like continue nurturing that, which is great. Um, but I understand sometimes that can be really hard to, uh, <laughs> to get them to that stage. I can understand that a lot of schools have a lot of readers that just will never pick up a book. They hate reading. They're never going to look at them. And um, so what we can do is design some activities and opportunities to get them just looking at a book, starting off the first step kind of thing. So the first one, oh, I have made a little graphic thing by the mistake. I didn't realize that. Uh, the first one that I want to talk to you about is the book path. So that's me standing in the corner showing, uh, <laughs> demonstrating what a book path looks like. Book paths are great fun. Um, they are basically a choose your own adventure um, activity where you go, um, basically you lay down a guide with different arrows and different um, themes or genres. Um, and the students have to pick what path they want to go on. So the first one would be like, oh, do you prefer fiction or nonfiction? The student will say, I prefer fiction. So they follow that path. The next kind of um, diverging path would say, do you prefer standalones or series? Oh, I prefer standalones. Okay, great. You go and follow that path. Do you prefer uh, longer bo books or shorter books? Oh, I prefer longer books right now. Okay, great. Follow that path. And then you can divide them up into different genres. Would you like to read uh, romance or science fiction or fantasy or contemporary or whatever it is? And at the end of each pathway, you can kind of see it on the bottom picture there. <clears throat> you kind of set up a pile of books that fit into that theme. And um, it's just a really fun, interactive way for students to find out what kind of books are available for their preferences and their tastes. And um, so you have the books there. You can have them pick them up, sit down with them for a few minutes, have a flick through them. And if they don't like them, that's totally fine. They can put them back and they can pick up another book in that pile. Or if they want to start the path all over again, they can do that too. These book paths are really, really successful. And they have, <laughs> I don't know what it is with secondary school students, but they really love doing this, um, <laughs> which is always really fun. We had a school yesterday, I think, maybe the day before, um, who, you know, didn't, who had a few reluctant readers in the class um, and the champion of reading who was working with them said can I get a show of hands who would consider themselves a reader and only one student put up their hand which is fair enough and um, we get that quite a lot and then after the book to path activity they led it and they uh, got them all to kind of try out a new book <clears throat> by the time they finished the path um oh this was actually with a different workshop uh but they put up their hand and said is anyone considering themselves a reader now and half the class put their hand up and it wasn't with this one it was the next activity and I'm going to show you but it was more or less the same thing when we went to this school and did this activity with them. They uh, very much were a little bit hesitant and like, oh, I don't read. They're not for me. I'm not interested in this. Um, but I suppose when the opportunity is presented to them to explore something that is actually catering to their interests, they're going to hop onto it and give it a chance. That's all we need is just to give them a chance. <laughs> um, but the second activity is book tasting. This is the one that I have meant to say was the one from yesterday or the day before it's very successful the book tasting is great fun and <laughs> um, book tasting essentially is playing cafe or playing restaurant for an afternoon <laughs> which is great fun so you can kind of see in the bottom picture there there's a couple of um kind of plates and knives and forks uh what we do is that you kind of set up this lovely design you get the table mat out you dress it up like it's a restaurant there's table numbers and you put out little menu plates <clears throat> and there's um or like plates and then you have a menu 
and basically there's a pile of books in the middle of the of the table and they can taste uh quote unquote taste the books by picking them up reading them for five minutes putting them down and then moving on to the next book and after every book that they have five minutes to flick through they can write details down so they can write the name of the book the author um what they thought about it if they liked it disliked it why and that kind of thing and it's very quick um it's very quick activity there's a very quick turnover they only spend maybe five minutes with each book um but the point of the little kind of review booklet is to make sure that if they did like it they can come back and visit it after the session is over but the point of this is just to get them exposed to as many books as they possibly can. And it's just a little bit more of a, <laughs> it's more of an interactive way where they're kind of being told, sit down and have a flick through books rather than um, kind of letting them do it at their own pace because they might not engage with it as um, fully if they are left to do that. So it's kind of nice to give them uh, an activity in which they can do this. So book tasting is always really fun. <clears throat> These two activities, I have materials available for them. If you are interested in doing any of these activities with your school, please do feel free to email me at bookgiftingatchildrensbooksireland.ie and I will send you the materials that you will need for these um, so you don't have to make them all from scratch. They're already there. Um, and I probably will send them out anyway, but if I forget, just remind me. So those two activities are great for students who just have no, I suppose, reference point as to what kind of books they would like. But if you did want to, I suppose, do a little bit of an activity with students who have read a book or two or who want to kind of talk about the books that they have read, uh, these two activities are great fun. So there's walking debates. Um, walking debates are kind of self-explanatory, and I know that a lot of schools do them, uh, particularly in transition year, in terms of like debating tactics and teaching them how to debate. Um, but you can also do it for books. So, for example, if you were to read a class book with the with the whole class, um, you have kind of all of them at the same base together where you're all talking about the same story and everybody kind of has a similar sense of like what's been happening in the book. And you can basically lay out a um, bunch of sheets on the floor, clear the whole classroom, tables to the walls, the whole thing, the floor is totally empty. And you're going to put disagree on one end and agree on the other end. You can put like, you know, middling points in the, in the middle of the floor. But the point of it is that the disagreeers are going to go on the very left hand side and the agreeers are going to go on the very right hand side. And what you're going to do is get everyone to start in the middle and you're going to say statements in relation to a book that you read together. Or if you wanted to do it a little bit more generically, you can ask questions and make statements about reading in general and books in general. <clears throat> but the ones I have, for example, here are to do with specific books. And what you do is that you ask the statement and you say, okay, if you agree with this, you go on this side or like the scale. So you allow them to kind of not go all the way to the end or they can hover in between or they can move around um, to different points on the spectrum. And um, what you do is that they can, there's there's kind of two main points that you need to take into consideration when you're doing the walking debates. Whatever uh, stance they take, they are valid in their, I suppose, opinion on of it, but you do need to make sure that they have a good reason as to why they make uh, a agreement or a disagreement and um, because you'll be encouraging them to talk about why they chose to stand at this point on the spectrum or this point on the spectrum. <clears throat> and um, secondly, the most important thing is that they're allowed to change their minds. And if they want to move around after hearing arguments for or against uh, the statements, then they can move their around and then you just move on to the next one. And it's a great way to kind of get them talking about the books um, and really getting them to engage with it. Some questions I think are really interesting um, to pose to the students. Uh, this character was right in their decision to do X, Y, and Z. So, for example, our protagonist was right to kill the king because blah, blah, blah. And they can agree or disagree with it. Um, this scene in the chapter was the most important chapter in the book. Um, so if this one's quite really subjective because different students will interpret different uh, turning points in each book. So it's always really interesting to see, oh, I don't think this is the most important because this scene happens later and that's even more important, that kind of thing. So it's really great to kind of get them thinking about uh, certain, the context in which the book is written. Um, I enjoy the, writers, the author's writing style. This is, again, kind of giving them agency and validating their personal tastes and their preferences. 
and just making sure that like there's an opportunity for them to explore why they enjoy something versus why they don't enjoy something. Uh, the main takeaway from the story is whatever. Um, you know, it could be the main takeaway of the story is uh, it's all about uh, finding friends on the way and that kind of thing. Or they might disagree and have a different interpretation from the story. And again, it's all about validating their perspective on it, just making sure that they have an opportunity to explore their viewpoints on it and change their minds if they would like to. Um, and a question that I think is really interesting, and I love listening to people talk about this, the opening line was better than the closing line. So it makes them really think, how does your, how does the story change so drastically from the very beginning opening line to the very end? What is a better line? Is it better written? Does it have more meaning? Is it funnier? Is it more serious? Why is one, is the opening line better than the closing line or versa, vice versa? Um, and it's a very subjective, a lot, a lot of these are very subjective questions and they always get really interesting answers. Um, the other thing I would say is just when you're kind of putting these questions together, you can use these or you can use whatever ones you want. I would just encourage kind of staying away from any thematic, um, I suppose, questions because uh, those questions are great in terms of encouraging literacy and doing that through your uh, English course. But if we're kind of focusing on encouraging reading for fun, you can still think critically, you can still kind of encourage that kind of analytical, um, I suppose, approach to it. But you want to make sure that the questions are less to do with, um, uh, I suppose, thematic analysis and more to do with preferences and tastes. Um, and also, as a bonus tip, you can get the students to write them if you don't want to do it yourself. <laughs> Um, and last but not least, in terms of activities, fan fiction. Uh, I think <laughs> fan fiction is a staple when it comes to, uh, you know, reading and falling in love with a book. These are for the diehard fans of books or people who are, you know, really, really engaging with the book that they've been presented with. Um, there's loads of different ways that you can do fan fiction. It's not just writing stories of what um, it looks like, but things you could do are uh, draw a comic of your favorite scene. So if it's a very text heavy book, you can get them to draw uh, a graphic novel or a, a comic strip of a scene from the book that they really enjoyed. Uh, redesign the book cover. These two are really good for kind of the artistic students. Um, and I know a lot of the schools that we work with have a very artistic um, community. So those two might be nice ones to do. <clears throat> Rewrite the opening scene. So that can be rewrite it in your own words or rewrite it with the twist, rewrite it as if it was set 50 years in the future, or rewrite it as if it was set in a completely different country or something like that, um, and just kind of giving it a different spin. Uh, write the blurb as if it was in a different genre. So that gives them, I suppose, a perspective on <laughs> uh, um, what kind of, again, it kind of helps them explore their preferences and tastes and genres. Uh, there's a couple of YouTube channels actually that do this really well, where they like take a horror film and they edit it and make it look like a rom-com and they're really really funny so you could get them to watch that and give them like a I suppose perspective on what like different genres look like and what are the tropes and the uh kind of reassure the the themes that come up over and over again in different genres and uh they can always be really funny to rewrite those uh you can write a diary entry of your imagined epilogue so you finish the book, you all read them together or you read it individually <clears throat> and you're going to write a diary entry from the perspective of the protagonist, but you're going to do it um, in a diary format. So I, you know, this is what happened after the story ended, but writing it in a diary format is always a really, uh, I suppose, creative way to really engage with the characters. For the drama students, of which I was one, <laughs> I always found these really good fun. Acting out a scene between two characters in the story, uh, it can be a made-up scene that they improvise, or it can be a scripted scene taken from extracts of the book, whatever they like. Um, interview with your least favorite character. Get them to really engage with why they don't like certain things in books, because it's totally fine if they don't, but let's think about why that is. Um, so they could write questions to their least favorite character in the book and then answer them as if they were the least favorite character, if that makes sense. Um, and it really gets them to... <laughs> understand what makes an engaging character or a disengaging character or do they dislike them but they find them really interesting to read about what is it that makes this character your least favorite I suppose is a good way to do it um, and the last one I'm going to say this comes with a caveat but write an email or a letter to the author and um, 
generally authors do love getting letters from their readers and hearing from them and um, it's a really nice way for them to engage with the community as a whole but I will say there's kind of two things you need to keep in mind one don't expect a response from them they are not obligated to respond to uh, a reader if they do that's really lovely but they're not obligated to do so and second um, avoid framing any questions that they might ask as if it's a requirement of an assignment because the author doesn't want to feel uh, obligated <laughs> to respond because it's part of an assignment or anything like that. It's just fan letters. It's just writing as an act of admiration to an author. And that can be done through their publisher or sometimes they have their information on their website. It depends. Um, but you can check and see what is appropriate for each one. So those are the activities. And for the next 10, five, 10 minutes, I'm going to uh, give some book recommendations because that is... The main part of my job um, and kind of making sure that you're tying in what books you talk about with your students to their specific interests so this is the thing that came up over and over again they don't um enjoy reading because they can't find anything that interests them um the reason that we do loads of reading lists and different reviews is so that there is a book for every reader and these are just some based on different themes and topics that might captured the interest of your students and I'm going to fly through them very very quickly because there is a lot there's a hundred books here and I'm not going to spend all time talking about them uh the first one is film and tv these are all films these are all books that are made into film or tv shows uh the first top four I think are on on Netflix the hate you give might be Disney but I can't remember uh but the rest of them are on Netflix the knife of never letting go is made into a film with Tom Holland but the name of the book is different to the name of the film and I can't remember the name of the film for life me uh everything everything is also a film song of songbirds and snakes is the sequel to or the prequel sorry to the hunger games and the film is coming out this month very excited to go see it the monster calls is also a film from a year a few years ago uh lgbtqia plus stories these are all really excellent books the henna wars the falling in love montage uh, Flying Tips for Flightless Birds and Gut Feelings are all Irish books. Um, <clears throat> there is a range of representation in here. There are bi people, uh, lesbians, um, aromantic and asexual people, uh, Black Flamingo is about a drag queen and it's amazing. Um, Gut Feelings is about disability and being uh, part of the LGBTQIA community. Um, so these are all excellent books. You might recognize they both die at the end as the TikTok famous book, and it's quite good. And it's a great one to get them interested in if they're interested in like social media. That's a nice gateway book. <laughs> a gateway book. Um, then we have sport, my area of complete <laughs> lacking. It's the one area that I really don't know many books about. But the crossover is excellent. It's a graphic novel slash verse novel um, about basketball. Gloves Off and The Boxer are both boxing books. Patina or Patina, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, is track and racing. How to Be a Footballer and The Great Irish Book of Gaelic Games are non-fiction books. Uh, the Great Irish Book is like massive and um, is part of a series by Gill Books. Fantasy Sports is a trilogy, may have more, and book down here is a verse novel about football. So there's loads of books here. There's a range where like a lot of them are illustrated as well. So it's a little bit more accessible. And um, so there's a nice kind of different options that you can look at here. Then we have games. This one is my favorite. <laughs> These are really interesting to me because we find that in recent years, uh, gaming, especially through PlayStation has gotten very storytelling heavy. So a lot of the video games that are coming out recently that a lot of young people are playing are very storytelling um, based. And there are some books that complement those kind of stories really, really well. So The Last of Us Part Two, if you want, if you played that and you loved it, I'd recommend a uh, long way down by jason reynolds god of war i'd recommend norse myths uh tales of odin thor and loki it's a non-fiction book <clears throat> stray which is a post-apocalyptic post-apocalyptic book and um, game about a cat in a world of robots if you like that try the quiet at the end of the world by lauren james it is excellent and the wolf among us is a fairy tale reselling retelling series where it's like a choose your own adventure kind of thing and i'd recommend tangoweed and brian which is feminist retellings of classic fairy tales then for the artists we have loads of series here for the artists nightlights and hickety they are a duology together primer is a graphic novel sylvie and piero are both 
um, artists' memoirs told through a graphic novel form. And then Bigger Picture, Black Artists, and We Are the Artists are all nonfiction books. Uh, science books. We have uh, Memory Superpowers talks about psychology and the brain anatomy. Um, Galaxy Girls, Women in Science are all about women in STEM. Great Irish Science Book um, is a great one about uh, kind of science told through an Irish perspective, which I think is quite interesting. Again, it's one of those giant books that kids love, that students love. And uh, we have Ushin McGann's uh, Hopeful Guide to Climate Change, which I think is probably <laughs> one of the best ways to approach climate change um, in a way that's not going to terrify the students. Um, and we have A Diary of a Nun, yeah, of a nun Young Naturalist. Uh, this book is Cruelty Free and The Summer We Turn Green. They're all great books about environmentalism and biology, which I know don't really fall into STEM, but I had to include them there. Uh, history. We have loads of history books, especially in Ireland. Black 47 and the Deadly Normans are Irish books, Black 47 about the famine, and Deadly Irish History of the Normans is about the Normans. Uh, Battle of Cable Street, Over the Line, White Eagles, and Secrets Act. Oh, sorry, Alison is also Irish in the Secrets Act. Are all uh, kind of post war or during the war stories, um, World War One and Two. And then Kamosha and Cane Warriors are both, they're both Jamaican Irish or Jamaican historical fiction, I think but they're um, different time periods. I think one's 1500s and the other 1700s. Don't quote me on that. I might be wrong with those. Um, then we have some mythology because we do love a good bit of mythology. Irish mythology, Savage Her Reply, Mythological uh, Irish Wonders, Girls Who Slay Monsters, Gods Don't Cry uh, are all Irish mythology. Um, Mythologica is a kind of compendium uh, and it's a really beautiful, gigantic book, brilliantly illustrated. They should be in all of your libraries. Uh, the Boy Lost in the Maze and Lore are both Greek mythology. Um, but there's more to different types of um, myths and legends that can be explored through different books. But a lot of these, I think all except the two down at the bottom here, Girls Who Say Monsters and Gods Don't Cry, should be in your school. Um, and a lot of the books in these recommendations are going to be in your school as well. Funny books. Not My Problem, uh, Frankie's World are both Irish books. Sisters of the Mist and Lumberjames are graphic novels. Uh, the Humiliations of Welton Blake is a very short Barrington Stoke novel. Um, You're the One I Want. Uh, Gwen and Kofi are all really excellent uh, funny books with like, where funny isn't, I suppose, the main point of the book, but they're great, great fun. Uh, food books. I <laughs> was going through what kind of books I'd recommend and I realized I have an entire, I have enough books recommendations to justify a food page. Uh, the Do's and Donuts of Donut, The Do's and Donuts of Love, um, Caramel Hearts are by Irish authors, um, With the Fire and High, and A Faux Story and Chinglish have a very strong emphasis on food that's related to your culture and your identity, um, and Domina Small and Starfish um, are books that really focus. Oh, and Do's and Donuts of Love have a lot of um, fat, fat positivity in their books, which is quite lovely. And Pumpkin Heads is a lovely graphic novel. Um, music. I'm going to fly through these. Silver Chain and Solo are verse novels. Wink is a book about um, a student or a, a boy who uh, has a, a cancer in his eye. And it's about him kind of using music to escape it. Um, Sing If You Can't Dance, As Far As You'll Take Me are kind of for older readers. Secrets of a Rebel Rockstar um, is for a younger reader. Music Legends is nonfiction. <clears throat> Places You've Cried in Public explores, um, I suppose, an abusive relationship and the role that music plays in escaping that. I will say, this reminds me to uh, check the age groups of these kind of books because Wink is very much on the younger end of teen and YA books because that would be suitable for 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds. But the place I've cried in public is strictly 17, 18 year olds. So just kind of take a look at what do you think might be appropriate and um, going through the blurb, having a flick through what content is actually in the book. And if you're ever stuck, please do. All of these are reviewed on the Children's Books Ireland website. So they're available for you to read the review there and get a better sense of what's going on with them. <clears throat> Irish language books. This is another area that I am very much lacking in, but these are all, um, all eight books in this list are in your library and are available for you to read. I personally am very excited to read Noni very, very soon. I hope someday. 
but um, these are all excellent books that are available to you. Um, easy reads. These are all books that you can and I have read in one setting, sitting and as someone who does not have the greatest attention span, that is saying something. So you can read these in one go. These are the words. Um, is a poetry book. Julia and the Shark is a little bit on the text heavy side, but has some beautiful illustrations in it. One is a verse novel of Mice and Men and Wuthering Heights uh, are retellings of the classic books done through Barrington Stoke. And they're very, um, I think, I think Mice and Men actually isn't abridged. I think it is just a different font and different paper, but I think it's the full text. And Wuthering Heights is abridged. So it's language is a lot simpler. It's a lot less, uh, it's a little bit more updated, but you really get the themes and the gist of the story, um, which is great. And graphic novels are New Kid, Sanko's Club. Um, they're great reads, really enjoy sitting them, reading them in one sitting. And uh, you might notice something that we get a lot in school visits is that uh, we'll ask a student, oh, what do you like to read or why aren't you reading a book kind of thing? And we often get the answer, I don't know how to read. <laughs> Which I kind of respect the uh, <laughs> the bluntness of saying that. Um, but I always turn back to them and say, well, if you can't read, Here's a book that you can take a look at that only has pictures. It's a wordless picture book. The Arrival by Shantan is a classic. It's excellent. And it's a, a really great one to kind of turn around and say to them, oh, you can't read, you can definitely read this one. Um, so that's it for me. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, sorry, I have a question straight away. I totally forgot to ask this at the last uh, children's book Ireland thing I attended. Um, I know that these are all recorded, which is great, but was there any chance you'd be able to do is there a list of all those gorgeous books and I'm just <laughs> I just I'm so excited getting to even look at them um we're, we're getting it we, we obviously got the big book rent and stuff so it's it's going to be wonderful when we get them but um would you have a lovely list I would I will absolutely send the PowerPoint presentation to everyone I'm going to send it to everyone at the end of all the sessions which is next Hi. week is our last so get them by for the end of the month if that's okay Fabulous. that's perfect that's no problem at all thanks no problem. It would be great for the, the kids to um to kind of take a look or to have a good think because the Davenham schools will all have another book order to do in the new year um, mm -hmm. to top up their libraries. So it'll be a really great opportunity off the back of this um to, to find out what they actually want, what they'd like. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of books in there that the school will have already received, but there's a good chunk of them that I haven't put in the starter libraries um, that you can use, but also if you go onto the and I know we've talked about this before, but if you go onto the Children's Books Ireland website, all of these reviews are available on their website, and you can filter them by age, category, genre. You can even search by like keywords, which is basically how I find ninety five percent of these books. Um, but yeah, that is a massive tool for when you're deciding what books you're picking out. They're great. Oh, Oshin, you're on mute there. Um, sorry, so I thought it was on mute the whole time. Um, I must have just put it on. So, can I just ask a couple of things? First of all, how many students were surveyed altogether? Um, and the other thing is, was there any mention of audiobooks and how kind of engaged they are with audiobooks? That's a really good question. So, um, most of the answers that I've taken from for this presentation. Uh, we're taken from surveys of last year's uh, participants of book gifting programs. And I want to say, I want to say it was about 100, but I'm not entirely sure. So I can get back to you and give you the specific number. Um, but it was a nice survey size, which was really good to kind of get a range of people who were very interested in reading versus some who weren't interested in reading. Um, their relationship with audiobooks was fascinating to me. So many of them didn't know where they could get audiobooks for free. Um, so introducing them to the library services and telling them that you can get audiobooks that aren't on Audible. You don't have to pay for audiobooks a lot of the times. And um, if you want, you can, but you don't have to. And um, a lot of them just said, I don't know what an audiobook is, which is astounding to me. And um, I can get some statistics if you're interested in those and I can send them over to you. But yeah, there's a real, um, I suppose, a disconnect um, in terms of listening to audiobooks with with younger readers. And I think it's, um, I don't know, I think it's that kind of reframing that we need to do to make sure that the phones aren't being weaponized or like used as a as a reason not to to go near a book, but they can be used in, in tandem with the with the reading habits, if that makes sense. So just on the follow up to that, then 
in terms of the kind of the reading champion project um, or the book gifting, um, would do you think it'd be an idea to get a librarian in each school, like a public librarian in, and explain to them because the kids might not make the connection between audiobooks, a library membership, bar box, whereas actually if they kind of see it just for the sake of having like a number they can put into their phone, they will then have access to all this stuff. But they might not automatically oh. think, um, oh, I, if I'm going to a library, I have to go into the library. I have to, um, yeah. you know, have to go through yeah, all that. To remember. Yeah. No, one hundred percent. Um, agree with you. There, um, there have been schools where we worked with them, and it's it's like obviously every school has different needs and different access levels to libraries. Some schools really don't get like they don't have a library down the road, while others do. Um, so that's not this isn't a, a commentary on that at all. We understand that there are limitations, but there are some schools that don't have a relationship with their local librarian. And you can see the parallel between them not having um, an understanding of what resources are available to them without having to go physically into the library versus those who have had regular library visits, librarian visits from their local library and them having a better understanding as to what resources are available to them. So it's definitely something we're pursuing and something we can look at for the Davenham schools in terms of engaging local libraries because they're all in Clondalk and so we can all um, look at doing that over the course of the three years. Okay, thanks. No problem. But yeah, if anyone has any, any either of you have any questions in between um, after today's presentation, you can let me know. You have my email address and yeah, I will send those book recommendations on to you by the end of the month. Love stuff. Love your stuff. Thanks, Emil. No Thanks. problem. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Thanks, Oshin. Well done, Ruth. Thank you. Oh, bye would bye. you mind recording, actually?